Can you, can you go a little bit into the strategy? So it sounds like you definitely have your, your route mapped, at least we'll say within, um, like civilized, you know, if you will, or, uh, I don't know the best way to phrase it, but where, where man is or where human beings are, um, it sounds like you use a very deliberate, um, route and then with plan stops throughout, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you, I mean, I'll, I'll touch on the Americas, if you want to touch on the, the polar regions, because mm -hmm. in, in the, the Americas, so to speak, basically what we're looking at is a Pan American highway. So we, we stuck to the Pan American highway, because if anybody's going to drive and do an expedition or drive north to south or south to north, they take the Pan Americana. And for us, there's actually a legacy aspect. So what we did was to plan our charging network, which all started about six years ago. So when we when this idea came, kind of came to fruition and kind of wanted to work on it. And I planned the entire route. Um, I used PlugShare quite a lot, um, planned the route through PlugShare. And then I looked at where the gaps were and I reached out to NLX Way, who are quite prominent in South America and Central America, and said to these guys, look, this is what I'm doing, um, but we don't have enough charges in South America. Could you support us? And these guys worked with me to build charging uh, AC, Chargers predominantly 22 and seven kilowatt AC chargers in Central and South America. So they put chargers pretty much every 100 to 150 miles along our route. And those chargers are staying there. They're there for, for people to use. But in Peru, what they did, they went above and beyond in Peru. Um, and we put AC chargers in, but they also put DC chargers on a 800 mile stretch. Mm -hmm. And so in Peru, when we passed through there, there were originally there was like three chargers in Peru. Now there's a whole charging network border to border. And so we, we worked on that as a strategy and we knew in North America, we had a great, there's a great charging network. Um, there's some things that need to be addressed around reliability with some providers, but, um, um, in Canada, they've got a good network, but Northwest territories was kind of like bare. Patchy, yeah. Um, but the polar regions are where we got creative and interesting, wasn't it? Yeah. So in the polar regions, obviously there is no charging infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> And so we, we had to find a solution to charge. And one of the most reliable ways of charging is um, using a petrol generator. So that's what we took along with us. But um, we wanted to also um, test um, some renewable energies while we're up there. Um, so we took with us a windmill up in the Arctic um, because the Arctic is the, supposed to be the second windiest place on sure. Earth. So we um, you've innovated and um, pioneered this mobile windmill system that we would uh, trailer along with us in the Arctic when we would stop, we would charge. And uh, unfortunately, Mother Nature didn't. <laughs> Wasn't windy. <laughs> and um, when we arrived, as uh, like you were saying, it's like the sun gods came out and it was zero wind, which was like massively disappointing um, sure. because we put our blood, sweat and tears and a lot of hard work has gone into developing the system and uh, we couldn't fully utilize it um, in the Arctic. However, um, in the south, in Antarctica, it's 24 seven daylight. So we took our um, solar panels with us and um, combined with an inverter and, and plugged into the generator to produce like a hybrid system where we could um, Whilst we were charging the car, we could offset um, a lot of the fuel usage by using the solar panels. So these things are prototypes. Obviously, solar panels and windmills not, but the interface to them are prototypes. First time trying it and um, trying something new. And the solar panels worked really well. Yeah. Solar panels really yeah. worked really well. Yeah, in, in Antarctica when the sun was shining. Um, and yeah, so that's how we predominantly charge in those polar regions. And it's kind of interesting when we talk about it because there for a lot of people outside looking in would kind of go but you took a generator you're on an electric vehicle expedition why would you take a generator and and there's an element of yes as Julie said the, it's the most reliable way it's the only way we can charge in an area where there's no power but also in in these on, on antarctic expeditions um they won't allow you to go and do an expedition without using proven without it yeah well sure. without proven technology so yeah. and the generator is the proof so we that's how we got our permit basically and license to go into antarctica and do the expedition yeah and like and the thing you were saying like the we're proving the drivetrain of the car we're demonstrating you know how evs perform up there if how the batteries work up there you know all this type of you know how the ev functions was the prime, primary, primary focus 
of um, taking the car in the polar regions. And the thing is, this is step one. You know, this is the first time it's ever been done. And, you know, we will take these learnings and hopefully develop on them. And, you know, one day, Maybe we you, can you, have you a total know. renewable energy charging sure. station. Who knows? You know, so it's just baby steps, step by step, and um, hopefully one day we will get there where it will be unsupported, uh, fully unsupported. So from that perspective, um, like how big or like what support was with you through the entire trip? Yeah, I guess it's the best way to phrase it. So, so again, linked to the same principle of having the generator again to to go into the Arctic um, and get sign off on that. And again, Antarctica, you need to have proven technology as support. Um, you can't go on your own, basically, is, is the nutshell. It's too dangerous. Yeah. So well, we, yeah, no. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we basically went with Arctic trucks, the guys who modified the car. These are the experts yep. in polar expeditions. So they went with their, with their vehicles. And their traditional vehicles for Antarctica are um, Toyota Hiluxes. In the Arctic, um, they were trialing uh, Ford F-350s as a potential transition vehicle for them. Um, that's why we had F-350s up in the Arctic. Um, and they were with us in the Arctic and Antarctica. And then when we came out and we arrived in Yellowknife, Northern Northwest Territories up in Canada, mm -hmm. it was just us. Us on our okay. own all the way. Yeah. Um, and we relied purely on public charging network or the kindness of strangers where we couldn't get a charge. Sure. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, and the kindness of strangers um, really prevailed. I mean, there was a couple of instances up in the uh, Northwest Territories where there was gaps. We um, didn't have uh, enough uh, batteries. Well, there was no charges. There was no charges. So we, we didn't have enough charge to get us to our next destination. So we knocked on the doors of various businesses, um, establishments, and um, asking for a charge. And the the community um just got behind us. Got behind us. It was cool. They went above and beyond to help us. And I kind of quite like those moments. And I think after having done the Mongol rally, that's what um, I like about this particular venture is that these are where the connections are made. Because, yes, you could go to use public chargers, but it's kind of faceless. You just plug into a machine. It's non normally nobody mm -hmm. there. And you charge your car and you move on. But when you ask for help and um, you, you tell them what you need, nine times out of ten they help you and that's like i say where the magic happens and you get to meet people and exchange stories and yeah it's just the kindness of complete strangers and what they do to to help you get on your way is unbelievable yeah. absolutely blown away by by um, the, all these amazing people from canada right through down to chile yeah definitely and, and i guess it also gives us the opportunity to say where the gaps in the in the infrastructure is right um northwest territory so for people to give perspective, if they want to map it, uh, Google map it, it's, it's Yellowknife up in the Northwest Territories down towards Edmonton. And there's very little charges around in a lot of those small towns um, and areas. So um, it's it's kind of saying to the you know, Canadian governments, to people out there, it's like, this is where we need charges. This is where the wind network is. To get, we need charges to grow. Um, in other areas, we were okay for charging. So we just plugged into DC and moved on. And, and as Julie says, sometimes that's, that's the boring part because you don't meet as many people. But then, so we, 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 the car ended up becoming called Sonrisa because she, uh, the Spanish for smile, because she always made everybody smile. <laughs> um, name given to her by Julie. And, um, when we drove through Canada and Alberta with the, you know, the big gas, oil and gas territories and things like this, and then, and some parts of the US, everybody loved the car. Everybody loved the car because of the big tires and because of the way. Sure. It was, so, yeah, it was, yeah. Lots of so, no, that's no, it's, it's, it's very interesting. One thing I think is is interesting, and it, and it may not again, right? It, it's it's not necessarily suitable for all all people's needs. But uh, one of our uh, associates here, um, uh, Dave, would always like when we were talking about my trip. Um, I did it in a diesel vehicle, completely different. But um, initially, I was waiting for like the Power Boost F one fifty. We knew it was there was rumors of it coming out. wasn't no, no idea if it would just be what type of hybrid it would be or not. Um, Ultimately, I, I'm pretty happy with my truck as is. I'm, I'd be very interested, maybe in like a second or, or third generation, you know, hybrid or maybe a next generation, um, you know, EV truck or something like that. But he's like, uh, you know, wherever. One thing that's interesting is, typically speaking, and and you you can probably speak to this again much better than anyone else. Wherever there's people, there's electricity. So, not that it's you can necessarily rely on 
depending on what you're doing on 110 and just plugging into, you know, like the outlet of someone's house with an extension cord. But it's um, well, it's at least something. Well, you, I mean, you can. I've seen people do it, but it's in our case in the Americas, and, <laughs> as in in America and Canada. So I don't know if you're aware, but um, our car is a European car. I didn't know if you were aware of that. Anyway, it's yeah. a no, no, okay. European yeah. area um, that we had modified in Iceland and then um, it got uh, shipped to Nova Scotia. And okay. We we, um, we drove so from Nova Scotia across to Edmonton in the car and then went up north with it. Yes. So we've actually done coast to coast in America, in Canada as well. So, But because it's a European car, European um, power outlets are 220. And the vehicle, oh. the vehicle requires to see about 1.5, 1.6 kilowatt, so 220. Before it'll before it'll register a charge, so we had a bit of a challenge. Um, so and yeah, so we couldn't just use the one ten, unfortunately. So you had to plug into people's uh, dryer outlets. And, and... <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so we uh, we had we had that challenge as well, and, and obviously in in the US and Canada, you guys love your plug sockets, and, and no dis no disrespect to everybody, but you have so many different plug sockets. So we had to oh plug. yeah, so we had armed ourselves with every plug socket adapter that we we could think of. Um, and yeah. then found some new ones while we were trying to find, you know, work on other dryer sockets. So we, um, we, we, it was quite a challenge. We had this charging cable um, from Juice Boost yeah. um, Technologies, and it's kind of like the Edward Scissorhands of uh, charging cable, <laughs> charging plugs, because that you yeah. it would be, or the Swiss Army knife of yeah. the charging plugs, because you would have the actual charging cable, and then you'd have like a array of different plug types that you could like plug onto the end. And uh, we carried that with us and yeah. uh, used that throughout Canada and America. It's and really so we funny. added that. And but what that also meant is we were a type two vehicle uh, for AC charging, not type one. So AC, DC charging okay. were type two, not type one. <laughs> so we needed to use adapters um, to convert from uh, type two to type one to use US and Canadian chargers. Yeah. And that in itself caused a few complications for as well, because some chargers didn't like the, the adapters. So yeah. um, we, we figured it out in the end. <laughs> we got it sorted. And um, like I said, with all the modifications we made to the car, you, we said, you know, we think we've made it difficult for ourselves, but then taking a European car because that was the only models yeah. that were available at the time. Yeah. Um, we made it even more difficult on ourselves and we sure. still made it. And we still made <laughs> yeah. it. Nicely. But I, I think we're a unique case, though, you know, um, there's, yeah, you know, there's very rare yeah. to have a European electric vehicle in sure. South America. So um, it's just like I say, it happened that. Yeah. That with 39 inch tires, with, with a rooftop 10 box, <laughs> 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 with a big, huge skid plate um, and, a, and a leisure battery mounted in the back, which we never said as well. We had a, a small leisure battery mounted in the back. And that powered your my coffee superpower. Machine. <laughs> ah, Where's the coffee fair machine? enough. I mean, it makes the world go round, literally, you know, so. 